You'll be inspired by both the sounds and sights as we explore in-depth coastal living. Over the past 20 years as a garden designer, I've enjoyed helping homeowners create private sanctuaries full of beauty and wonder. I find each garden to be a fresh opportunity to explore ways to create uniquely personal spaces. These are just a few of the gardens I've helped to transform into garden homes. Hi, I'm Alan Smith. Welcome to The Garden Home. This is a show about design that helps us to push the boundaries of our home outdoors to expand our living spaces. Now some of the best examples of this can be found in homes located along the water. That's why we're here in Rosemary Beach, Florida, where we're going to explore some of these ideas a little further. This is actually a planned community which welcomes residents as well as vacationers looking for a taste of living on the coast. I mean, just look at some of these amazing examples of design, both inside and out. We'll step inside one of Rosemary Beach's showplace cottages and talk to a designer to discover more about this signature style of beach living. We'll also see how people are getting out and enjoying the beauty of the Gulf. I have to say that's one of the reasons I enjoy coming to a destination like this. Plenty of places to eat, walk, ride bikes, shop, play, and yes, I couldn't resist an opportunity to interview a chef while I was here. We'll stop in and see him later. But first, Philip Sides is an interior designer who trained as an architect. He employs principles of design that can be used both inside and out. Let's step inside this cottage and see an example of his work. Hey, Philip. Hey, Alan, how are you? Very well, thank right. you. Right. Yeah, what a beautiful space. Yeah, it's a pretty wonderful space. Um, I remember the client saying he wanted it to feel more like a, a loft than, than a normal house, and I think the architect, Eric Watson, did a great job. Oh, I can see that. The light is just pouring in. Yeah, it's nice to have those transom windows up high that bring in the light, bounce off the ceiling. and. Well, it must make the space feel larger than it actually is. It does, uh, and I think by keeping the drapery colored closer to the wall, it, it kind of doesn't stop the eye also. It just reads as one sort of color theme across each wall. Exactly. And the shades as well, I mean, they're in the same color family as the drapery. Pretty much, yeah. yeah. Well, the houses are so close together, but you don't get a sense of that when you're right. here. That's, that's one nice thing about Rosemary Beach is these porches tend to give you that, that layering effect that keep you from being right up on your neighbor. Sitting in your neighbor's living room. Right. <laughs> <laughs> well, the porches are a wonderful transition space between inside and out. Yeah, yeah. Philip, I really like the color theme you've got going here. It's subtle, but it also has a strength. Yeah, it really is very subtle. You may think these walls are green, but it's nothing but the reflection off of the rug really? onto the wall. Yeah, the light here at the beach is very strong and it really penetrates into a house. So what color are the walls? The walls are dead white, uh, ex except for three planes that work through the room, which is a pale sky blue, and all of that is grounded by the dark brown sofas. And then we used a one continuous rug throughout the living room and dining room to bring the two spaces together. Anytime you repeat a color, it helps to unify a room. And you'll see varying shades of that blue happening about the room as well. So Philip, when you come into a space like this, what sorts of things do you do to pull it all together? Well, you've got two definite kinds of spaces here, a living room with a high ceiling, a dining room with a lower ceiling. So obviously color is a way to unify a space as is one continuous rug as opposed to breaking it up with two rugs. The other thing is to keep the scale of the furniture all in a similar scale and um, just bouncing spots of color off of your basic pieces that repeat themselves. Now did you start with certain items that you had to work around? Yeah, basically the two brown sofas were the beginning point and I chose what has become a rather popular color scheme this day and time, and that's blue and brown, and um, the two colors complement each other very nicely. It's really beautiful. You know, Philip, I'm always struck by the parallels between interior design and exterior design or landscape architecture. Oh, I agree completely. They're, 
many similarities, such things as the use of bold, simple elements. Framing views as you framing here in views, this room. Yeah. Bold uses of color and not just spattering color all about. And color choices. I mean, I find, as you've done here, by using pale, sort of soft, cool blue colors that it feels more expansive, whereas hot reds would make the room feel much smaller. Oh, absolutely. I never, I never use colors like that in a room because they're very tiring and um, are just difficult to live with. Well, Philip, thanks for showing me some of your work. It's been a lot of fun talking about design principles. It's been my pleasure. Glad to have you here. Here's a plant our Victorian ancestors would recognize. It's a palm. It was very popular for using in parlors of the day. But you know, this plant actually is all over the world. There are over 2,000 different species, and 11 of them are native to Florida. Now the reason this plant became so popular as a house plant is that it can take dim light, so it was ideal for using in the dark rooms of Victorian houses. Of course, back then they were rare and pretty pricey. But these days, the prices come down, they're much more affordable, and you can find them in most garden centers and nurseries. If you decide to grow a palm, you'll find they prefer a heavier soil than most of your house plants. And you can make a blend by simply taking some garden loam, say out of your backyard, one part of that to one part peat moss to one part sand. Now you'll want to keep this little recipe on hand because as your palm grows, it will need to be repotted every two years or so. You'll know when it's time for repotting because the roots will begin to crowd in the container. Now for me, the biggest challenge isn't caring for a palm, but it's actually selecting among all the varieties that are available to us. For instance, if you're looking for something small, you might try one of these dwarf date palms. And for something more robust, there's the Chinese fan palm. Of course, if your goal is to fill the corner of a room, you might try one of these arecas. Now all of these palms prefer indirect light. Too much intense sunlight can burn the fronds. So if it's in a window, you might want to hang a sheer drape. It's astonishing the range of house plants you can find in garden centers today. For instance, take a look at this white bird of paradise plant. These have become very popular as indoor house plants because of their bold foliage and beautiful blooms. These tropical beauties can be found growing outdoors where temperatures don't regularly drop below 28 degrees. So if freezing isn't a threat, these plants can grow into massive clumps, reaching 30 feet in height or more. Of course, they won't grow that large in a container. Like so many house plants, the bird of paradise doesn't like to be overwatered, so keep the soil slightly on the dry side, and it'll always respond best when placed in full direct light. Feeding it is important too, and I recommend a well-balanced solution of liquid fertilizer a couple of times a month during the growing season just hold back on feeding during the fall and winter. If you keep large house plants such as this on your deck or terrace during the summer and move them in during the winter, a little dolly like this can make moving them around much easier. of a tropical paradise, one of the first things that comes to mind are the plants. They're so lush, exotic, and beautiful. But you know, to enjoy that kind of a look in your garden, you don't have to live in the tropics. I had a visit with Randy Harrelson from the Gourd Garden near Rosemary Beach, Florida. He's full of ideas on how to bring a tropical feel to your garden. Randy, I can certainly see why you refer to this store as the Gourd Garden. You know, gourds <laughs> are one of the first plants I grew as a kid. Me too. I, I think gourds really brought me into gardening. Yeah, I agree. And there's something that is beautiful as nature grows it, and then it's a, a blank canvas for the artist to create something from it. 
They really are fascinating, and in this day and time, fairly useless. <laughs> it is, but it's not a useless item at all. The birds who live in that birdhouse consider it very useful. Well, this is quite a handsome house. Isn't it, though? And I noticed that they left the seed inside. Oh, yeah. The gourds are full of seeds, and you can uh, take them out and plant them, and you'll get a new gourd vine with lots of fruit on it in a single season. They grow like there's no tomorrow. They make beautiful vines with big, beautiful leaves and white flowers that bloom in the evening. All in one season. Yeah, all in one season. And they grow all different sizes. This gourd and this gourd and this gourd are all the same species of gourd. They're all Ligenaria, Ciceraria. And Amazing. yet they grow from this small to one bigger than you and I. This one was carved in Peru, and this one was carved in China. The etching is magnificent. They're beautiful. They've always been a canvas for fine artwork for thousands of years. You know, my great-grandparents used to use gourds to hold salt, to store it. You know, uh, the inside of a gourd has natural dehumidifying properties, so you can store salt or sugar and it keeps it dry. Keeps it from becoming cl in clods. Yes, yeah. exactly. And they're really easy to grow. Uh, you just grow them in regular garden soil. You just have to have a lot of room because the gourd will take up a lot of room, like a pumpkin. <laughs> Randy, I find that one of the best ways to bring boldness to a garden is with tropical plants. Absolutely. Nothing has bigger, bolder leaves than tropicals. And there's some beautiful flowers, gingers and such, but I really love tropicals most for their foliage. The, the textural contrast they can offer in a garden really is exceptional. Absolutely. The shapes of tropical leaves are all different. Some long, some round, some very uh, frilly, amazing. But the shades of green are so beautiful from you know, white and lime green, gold, deep greens of all different hues. They're just wonderful. Of course, many of our favorite house plants, our most beloved house plants, love it outside. They sure do. I bring my house plants out in good weather and put them right into the garden, right here in this courtyard. It's perfect. Uh, I love green plants. They don't have to be blooming for me to be happy with them sitting in the garden. How do you use tropicals in some of your design work? Do you use them as accents or do you use them to sort of fill in space? Because so many tropicals are large and bold, I use them for the shapes of the leaves, putting round together with long and spiky, together with frilly, to get very strong contrasts of texture and shape in the garden. That just creates more visual interest. Absolutely. And then you add the color and variation in the leaves themselves to add more interest, always going for a bold, clear combination. Of course, the alocasias and colocasias are some of my favorites, the elephant ears. Oh, they're some of my favorite plants. I just love them. I seldom do a garden down here without using elephant ears. I love that big leaf, the ribs of them. They come in so many beautiful colors of green and red and, and even purple. Black. Yes, they're <laughs> We did a mass planting of black magic, and it really was magical. I bet. And they're also great in containers, uh, the whole family. And, and if you move on into caladiums, there's, a, there's another choice for the palette. And often, a single elephant ear leaf is beautiful in a tall vase. A single leaf is enough to make a room. And of course, we can't forget about the bananas. I mean, these behind us you've planted in the courtyard are fantastic. Thank you. I love them. It's about the biggest leaf of any plant I grow. And on top of that, it has beautiful flowers and then makes fruit. And you know what's neat is down here, sometimes we even get the fruit to ripen because you take off the hand of bananas when it gets cold and take it inside into a cool place. And sometimes you'll get ripe bananas. Now, gardeners right up through zone five can grow these as a summer plant. Uh, they just store the stalks uh, in a cellar or in a basement over the winter and then replant them and then they get all that gorgeous foliage. And in fact, a banana really is a perennial uh, plant. It's herbaceous, it's not woody. Of course, the wonderful thing about bananas is they come in a wide range of sizes. So if you don't feel like you can host one this large, you can plant a dwarf. That's right, even uh, some that stay very low that work into perennial beds quite nicely. 
Of course, some of the other tropicals that I think are so fantastic are the Brugmansias, the angel trumpets. We love angels' trumpets, both the Brugmansias and the Deturas. The, uh, ha the Brugmansias hang down and the Deturas stand up and look right at you. And then, of course, there are Dracaenas that, that give you that spiky look in containers or just alone in the garden bed. Right. They make a great accent, uh, that tall, thin leaf. And then, of course, cordylines. I've used a lot in containers. I uh, love them. And I even like the one in the courtyard right here that's so dark and rich red. And I see a few other tropicals here in this courtyard. Oh, we love gingers. We use a lot of ginger. And uh, of course, the wandering Jew, which is a great house plant, also works beautifully in the garden, uh, spilling out from the beds. It's fantastic. You know, tropicals really are a good value. Oh, they're wonderful plants. I don't know about you, but after walking around the town with Randy, I've worked up an appetite. So why don't we step into a nano and see what our chef has created in the way of a beachside recipe. Start out with one of, more, one of our most popular dishes here at Onano. It's the sea scallops gremolata. It's my signature dish. A little lemon risotto. This is very, very light and refreshing with the scallops. Lemon goes well with most seafood. So we'll start that. I'll put the flame on about medium here. Risotto, you want to cook it slowly because if you cook it too fast, it'll release too much starch. Put a little fish stock in here, a little fish fumé, because it is seafood, so why not? Next, I'm going to add a little preserved lemon. Preserved lemon is a staple condiment in the Mediterranean, North Africa as well as Italy. Uh, get that in there, add a little kosher salt, a little white pepper. I like white pepper because white pepper, I feel, goes well with shellfish fish, and I'm going to give it a little stir. You want to baby the risotto. Risotto, you really want to keep a stir on it. Okay. Next, you're going to add some fat, because we need a little fat to cut the acid in the lemon for the risotto. So add a little mascarpone cheese. Turn the heat down just a little, because you don't want it to separate. Of course, you want to give that a little stir. Incorporate it all in. Bind it. You'll, pretty soon, you'll start to see you have a creamy texture on this. That's exactly what we're looking for when you make risotto. Okay, and then uh, also I'm gonna add just a touch of butter to this. Just a little butter right here. Get a little bit of that out. Just a little bit because you've already got a lot of cheese in there so you don't wanna kill somebody with too much fat. Right, next I'm gonna add a little asparagus. Asparagus, I pre-blanched it, so all I need to do is heat it up. Gives it a nice color, good crunchy texture to the dish as well. Go ahead and take it to the plate. Nice in the center here. It's a nice texture. For the sauce, for the scallops, I like to use a little fish stock once again. Four ounces of that. Put it on the flame. I'm gonna get this hot, of course, and then I'm gonna add some saffron. That's first because you want the saffron to bloom to give it that beautiful yellow color. Okay? saffron. Next, add a little shallot. Just a little bit there for crispness. Then, of course, once again, the preserved lemon. Just a little bit. So I let that heat up, get that going. Kind of stir it around a little bit, get that stuff blooming. Yeah, just let it simmer just for a second just to get it heated. Let that saffron, you know, take on that yellow color. And then I'll add a little butter to for a little richness. Keep stirring it. You don't need to add any salt to this because once it starts reducing it's a fish stock, it will get a little more concentrated with salt, so. Okay, and now I'm gonna go ahead and put it on the plate. Make sure you get some saffron threads in there. It's got a nice, lovely yellow color. Go ahead and add these, my scallops that I seared off earlier here. Got them a little brown on top for a little caramelization. Beautiful scallops. Now, down here on the Gulf Coast, uh, people tend to like shrimp. Shrimp is perfectly acceptable with this dish with the lemon. Like I said, it goes with most seafood. Uh, shrimp or any kind of Gulf grouper would be perfect. So I got the scallops on, and then I add just a simple herb mixture of chives, parsley, and basil. Great accompaniment to the scallops would be the heirloom variety tomato salad. I just take these and assort them on the plate, different colors. So you want to give a good visual. Okay, after I get the tomatoes on the plate, 
I like to take a little French sea salt. This is fleur de sel, it's very top quality salt, very natural, and add a little bit to that. Next, I'm gonna add the fresh tomato vinaigrette. This is a great vinaigrette. I did pound the tomatoes in the mortar. I didn't use a blender. Everything's done in a mortar there, old fashioned way, it's the best. I just kind of lightly drizzle that over that. So you're just basically getting tomato explosion here. It's just tomato, tomato, everything. So being that I am an Italian restaurant, I like to keep that Italian theme going. I'm gonna add a little prosciutto de parma to this. Prosciutto is a cured ham. And I'm gonna add a little cheese to this. This cheese here is Pecorino Romano. I believe it comes from the island of Sardinia in Italy. It's more of a salty cheese. It's not as buttery rich as Parmesan. I tend to like it a little better. So I'm gonna add a little bit of cheese to it there, just a few shards, okay? Almost complete, now I'm gonna add my fresh opal basil. These are microgreens from the chef's garden as well. I'm just gonna kind of lightly put those on the salad and uh, that's it. Oh my goodness, that looks beautiful. Fantastic, what a gorgeous presentation. Thank you so much. Look at this heirloom tomato salad. Three different types of heirloom tomatoes topped with these tiny opal basil. It's just beautiful. Now, I wish you could smell the aroma of this entree. It really is magnificent. We've got risotto with scallops and fresh herbs. For me, one of the greatest aspects of travel is the inspiration that comes from it. Beautiful architecture, great gardens, and hey, you can even shop. I love to find objects that reflect the spirit of the place. Let's check this one out. Well, hey, welcome to Tracery. Thank you. Now, the style here is really sort of a mixture, but it, you know, it feels like the place. It, it feels like coastal living. It definitely is. We try to set our style apart from the other beach shops as well, not the typical thing. Well, there's a wide range of things here that could be used both inside and out, but I guess everything here is for the interior. Definitely so. That's where we kind of sometimes use things like teak panels or gates to do room separations and that sort of thing. Yeah, well I can see the scale of these objects would really dominate a space. I think a lot of people are scared to, to use a large item in a room, whereas especially when you have really tall ceilings, you need something large. Need something bold to serve right. as a focal point. Right, which is where a lot of times we'll use artwork. Like we have a local artist who we use in a lot of places and that just gives that element of color and impact of the size as well. I noticed that your use of color is to, to use neutrals, but then I see elements of color popping forward. Right, that's really, starting with the neutral base is always nice because that way you can add your color with pillows and lamps mm -hmm. and all your accessories. And that way if you get tired of the color trends, you can change it out. Now I see a lot of blue and brown. Is that because it sort of reflects the coastal lifestyle, the water and the and the, and the land? Or definitely is, is, and it's just been a it's been a hot color combination the last several months. But I'm thinking that we're going to lean towards the oranges. I've seen a lot of that. So you're seeing the colors warm up and move in that direction. Exactly. Yeah. Well, you know, color forecasting I think is very interesting. Oh yeah, there's they do a lot of great combinations, and there's always new stuff. So when you're designing a beach house and you're selecting furniture, do you use a lot of upholstered furniture or how, how do you do that? We definitely try to do a little bit of a mixture of upholstered um, with fabric versus adding a little bit of leather in to break it up along with you know your wood and maybe glass, right. glass top tables. So you, you don't shy away from upholstered fabric because of, I'm just thinking people come in, they're wet, <laughs> they have sand on them. No, because most of our things you know can be sand proof and you know it's not you don't have to worry about it if you sit on it. Well you know there's so many amazing fabrics now it's 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 unbelievable the range you can get in fabric that'll actually uh, persist and and look great for a long time outdoors. Right there are a lot of sunbrella fabrics especially that have um, have a lot more color and pattern to it than they used to not have very many options. Yeah yeah you were pretty limited in the past. Mm -hmm. Well, thanks for showing me around. I think I'll do a little shopping. Well, you're welcome. Let me know if I can help you at all. I'll do it. Well, in today's show, we've certainly captured the spirit of coastal living and seen how both homes and gardens are inspired by this beautiful setting. I thought the cottage we toured with Phillips Sides really captured the idea of blurring the lines between inside and out. 
and we saw some amazing architecture and design techniques that you may want to try on your home. Well, I know what I'm going to do with my final hours here. I'm going to hit the beach. Until next time, from the Garden Home, I'm Alan Smith.